All right, brothers, thank you all for coming out tonight and um, to hear the word of the Lord, what God is going to speak to us tonight. If you have your Bibles, let's go to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. We want to talk to you about something tonight. Um, and I will just say, so we're going to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. I will say um, this year, um, I've been in the ministry for about 30 years. And um, one of my prayers that I pray is that I will stay close to God and uh, so that I can uh, finish my course. I want to be able to finish my race. I do not want to go before the Lord uh, when I stand before him and in my heart know that I haven't done everything that he wanted me to do. I think if I had a fear, that would be my biggest fear, not finishing and not doing everything that the Lord want me to do. Because I understand the repercussions of that. I understand that if I don't do everything that the Lord want me to do, then somebody is coming up short somewhere. If I'm not um, doing my part in the kingdom of God, then that means somebody else is missing out on um, what they're supposed to be getting through me. So uh, I always want to make sure that I, I'm praying that prayer. Lord, just let me finish my course. Let me finish what you want me to do. I don't want to just get started. Uh, I want to be able, I want to finish it so that I can hear you say, well done, not well almost done. Uh, you got started good, but well done. In other words, finished. You're, you finished what I put you in this earth to do. That's my main concern is doing what God has called me to do and finishing it. And uh, I'm aware that sometimes uh, people they get started in the Lord, but they don't allow the Lord to finish through them what he want them to do. I had a good friend, and I, most of my church members know this story, but I share it with you all. A, a good, dear friend of mine, he's gone on to be with the Lord now. But um, years ago, uh, I think it was about in the 50s or 60s, the Lord, uh, he was a preacher himself, and the Lord told him to go to Africa to preach. And at that time, he had a very uh, uh, lucrative company making quite a bit of money. And he had a wife and six children. And uh, he, told his, he told the Lord, no, Lord, I, I got a wife and, and six children I have to take care of. And so uh, later on that night, he had a vision that he was in a cornfield and uh, he was picking up corn, scooping it up, you know, the corn cobs, picking them up off the ground like this and trying to hold as many as he could in his arms. And he said that the more he tried to pick them up, the more was falling out of his, arm, uh, out of his arms. Of course, the corn represented money. And all of a sudden he heard a crackling behind him and he turned around and somebody had set the field on fire, the corn field on fire. He took off running and... Uh, uh, the fire caught up with him, you know, going down the, the row of corn, caught up with him, and it burned his right side, burned the right side of his body. And uh, so he went, so he came out of that vision, and he, he went to work the next morning, and when he went to work, he started throwing up. He started, he, he worked out in the woods uh, a logger. He was a logger like my daddy was. And uh, he started throwing up, and he got sick. To make a long story short, uh, he had contracted a disease called North American blastomycosis. And it's a disease, it turns your skin into fungus. It's like uh, spongy type, you know, where your skin is, your flesh, I should say, is very, very soft to where he could take his finger and just drive it all the way to the bone, you see, because his, his flesh had turned into something else. It wasn't like normal flesh. And that happened on the right side of his body. And so for seven years, he was down with that disease for seven years. And uh, he lost his business at that time. Uh, in fact, my daddy had bought, 
he was a, a logger, like I said, and so my daddy had bought one of his logging trucks uh, from him. But at that time, people that you owed money to, they could come and get everything out of your house. If you didn't have money or, or whatever, they could come in your house and they can get your refrigerator. They could go through your clothes and get your clothes. You know, they can gather your things to go and sell or to keep for themselves uh, for what you owed. And so it was the law that they couldn't, the only thing they could not take was the stove. And so that's all he had left in his house was the stove. They came and got the furniture. They came and got the clothes, the refrigerator. All he had was a stove. And so he was in that condition for seven years. Um, so he was telling me this story to encourage me. When God tells you to do something, you do it. You know, and I'm sure he, he left this world always wondering. And that's, that's one thing I do not want to do. I don't want to leave this world wondering what could have been had I been obedient. What would have happened had I just did what the Lord wanted me to do, you see? No doubt um, he would have been used mightily had he gone to Africa and uh, did what the Lord said do. But he was thinking about what was right in front of him. I got a wife and six children. I'm not going to Africa. I'm going to stay here and, and, and do and keep my job and keep making all this money, you see. And then ultimately what happened? He lost it all anyway. Lost it all. Everything but his house and his, and his stove, you see. And so that's one of my biggest things. I do not want to get started in anything in the Lord and not finish it. I want to be able to finish my course. Now, if, is everybody there? The 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. We're going, to, uh, we're going to start reading at verse 24. And we're going to look at a man today, uh, just real quickly. We're going to look at a man who started and didn't finish. The 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, we're going to start reading at verse uh, 24. It says, By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the, unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover, and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned, or were trying to do were drowned. All right. Now, and then the next verse, 30. Verse 30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. So that's talking about Joshua. And Israel, what Joshua accomplished. This was after Moses had died. Now, let's think about this. Moses, we see that he started off well. You see, he was, he was a prince in Egypt and was really next in line to be Pharaoh. But he forsook that. I don't want, I don't want to be called, I don't want to identify with these people because these are not my people. So he, he, by faith, he did that. And, of course, you, most of you, you know the story. Uh, one day when he was around the age of 40 years old, he, he looked and he saw uh, an Egyptian smiting one of his brothers, mistreating one of his brothers, and he stood up for him and killed the man and buried him in the sand. So he, he had a passion for his people. And then, of course, you know, the, 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 not long after that, he saw two, two of his brethren arguing among each other and looking like they were wanting to fight. And he went to talk to them, say, hey, y'all are brothers. Y'all shouldn't fight. And they say, you're going to kill us like you did the Egyptian? So that made him flee. So 40 years old, he fled, uh, got around this family, married the man's daughter, was in that place for another 40 years. And then at 80 years old is when he saw the burning bush. And God sent him back into Egypt. Now, I want you to think about this. E Egypt at that time was the most powerful nation in the world. And God sent him there with a stick. Not an army, not chariots, a stick. You're going to go and deliver my people 
with a stick. Now, I just, you know, I just want to share this with you all since we're here. God has always had a pattern. And, I, and I'm just sharing this uh, with you all. Mankind fell by a tree. And it was by a tree that we were delivered. And you see that pattern now throughout the Bible. You see, Moses went down as a type of Christ with a stick in his hand. He asked, he asked God, God, how am I going to deliver these people? What am, what am I, how am I going to do it? I'm just one man. And what did the Lord say? What is that in your hand? And you know, still to this day, God says that to us. A lot of times God gives us something to do. And we're looking for all of this extra stuff. We're looking for all this extra backup. And the whole time, we already got it in our hand. God has already supplied us with what we need to do what he's called us to do, see. And so he had a good start. He went down there. He, he brought about all the signs and wonders of God, the plagues. And he was able to overcome the most powerful nation in the world by faith. He was able to do that. He parted the Red Sea. They walked over on dry land. He was able, to, you know, to just do whatever God wanted him to do out there. He had a good start. But notice in this book of faith, in this chapter of faith here, it don't say anything about Moses bringing the children of Israel into the promised land. He started off doing that, but he didn't finish doing it. And then the question is, why? Why did Moses, why was he not able to finish what God wanted him to finish? Why did God have to raise up another man to finish what Moses had started? Could you imagine? In fact, let's go there. Let's go, let's go to, to, in my opinion, this is one of the saddest chapters in the Bible. Let's go to the 20th chapter of the book of Numbers. The 20th chapter of the book of Numbers. Now, Moses had been with these people out in the wilderness for 40 years. And, uh, you know, <laughs> he, he was dealing with a lot of stuff. Most of you, you know the story of what he was dealing with. If, uh, is everybody there? The, the 20th chapter of the book of Numbers? All right, we're going to start reading at verse 1. It says, Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. And the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses. That word chode means they strove with him. They were fussing with him. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? And why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have ye made us come out to come out of Egypt to bring us into all this evil place? It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and do what? Speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. Everybody see that? You see what he told them to do? He said, speak to the rock where? Before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts to drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord, as he commanded him. 
And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. Does everybody see the disobedience there? He was told to speak to the rock. But he was upset with those people. And he didn't speak to the rock. He spoke to the people. In the book of Psalms, it says he spoke unadvisedly. That basically the people got under his skin. And he spoke unadvisedly. He called them rebels. The Lord didn't tell him to do that. The Lord knew how, what condition they were in. But in his aggravation, he lost it. Instead of speaking to the rock for the rock to bring forth water, he spoke to the people in an angry manner. And then he smote the rock twice. Now, of course, if you know your Bible, you know that that rock was Jesus Christ. It was the same rock. That rock followed them for 40 years. It was Jesus Christ himself. That's what made it such a horrible, that's part of what made it such a horrible thing. He smote that rock twice. Now, think about this now. The rock brought forth water. So God honored him in that. But let's look at verse 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. Yeah, I'll read that now. I want you to think about it. Moses, we see the good start that he had. First 40 years of his life. And then he went off into the desert to hide for the next 40 years. So at 80 years old, when he was 80, the Lord called him back. You're going back into Egypt to finish what I wanted you to do. You're a deliverer, Moses. That that was your calling. So you're going back to do what I want you to do. So Moses, of course, you know the story. Well, you know, I can't speak well. What are the people going to say if I come back? And they're not going to believe me. Who am I going to tell them sent me? And all of that. And finally, God's anger was kindled and he shut all of that down. Moses went on back. Now, part of... Moses' problem. Let's go, in fact, let's go to the 14th chapter of the book of Numbers. Let's go over a few chapters. Actually, we'll go to the 13th chapter and we'll start reading in verse 26. Now, it took about, so I want to just give you a little background. It took about two weeks for the children of Israel to go from Egypt to the doorway of the promised land. That was about a two-week journey from the time they left Egypt to get to the promised land. After they got to the doorway of the promised land, God told them to send spies in. Y'all send spies in, spy out the land. And they sent the spies in to see, you know, where the weaknesses were, what was going on in the place. And Now, here they are. They sent them in for 40 days to spy out the land. After the 40 days, here we are at verse 26. They coming back with a report. Verse 26 in the 13th chapter of the book of Numbers, it says, And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them, and said, We came unto the land, whether thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled, and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. In other words, the giants. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, 
for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants and the, son of, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Two weeks now, and think about this. God didn't already show them all kinds of signs and wonders. He sent Moses down into Egypt, did all those signs and wonders, the plagues. They saw the sign of God. When he split the Red Sea. They walked through it. And then when the Egyptian army tried to walk through it, God caused it to come down upon them to kill them. They, they saw the sign of manna, that every day God would send manna from heaven to feed them. They saw all of those signs. Now, why did God give them those signs? So that when they got to the promised land and they saw the opposition, they would not faint in their hearts. They would be willing to go in because they'd understand what kind of God they served. Except they didn't. Look at what they said. We are grasshoppers. To us, we're grasshoppers, you know, concerning their size and how great they are. Now, I want you to think about Moses. Moses was sent to deliver them. At that time, he's still around 80 years old, maybe about 81 now. He, he's looking forward to retiring. He's already tired. I went down there, did all these plagues, did what God told me to do. Uh, Y'all right here at the doorway. Just go on in. God will give it to you. I still got the stick that I had when I came down to Egypt to deliver y'all. They're not going to whoop this. And then they sent in the spies, and the spies, 10 of them, bring an evil report. They brought the fruit of the land. Yeah, it's flowing with milk and honey. It's got fruit, just like you say it. But they're giants in the land. We can't overcome them. Now, I want you to imagine what Moses must have felt like to know we were almost there. All y'all all would have, because listen. It, 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 would, it would have took more than Moses to go in there. God was putting that on the people to go in there and, and conquer the land. Almost there. Almost. If we, if we just, if y'all just have faith, you could go in there. But they weren't trying to hear it. And Moses knowing, I'm your shepherd. I have to stay with you. Whatever, wherever your faith is, no matter where mine is, wherever your faith is, that's why I have to stay. And so, let's go, let's see, to chapter 14, verse 1. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness? And wherefore, in other words, why had the Lord brought us up? brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel and Joshua, the son of Nun and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stoned them with stones and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me and how long will it be? Ere, in other words, before they believe me, 
for all the signs which I have showed among them. I will smite them with pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. In other words, God was telling Moses, I'm going to kill every last one of these people and I'm going to start all over with you. You're going to be the new Abraham. You're going to be the new Jacob. I'm going to start. I'm going to kill all these people and then make a great nation of you. But look at verse 13. And Moses said unto the Lord, then the Egyptians shall hear it. For thou broughtest up this people in the might in thy might from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thou cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of a cloud, and in a pillar of fire by night. Now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he swore unto them. Therefore, he hath slain them in the wilderness. And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according unto the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt, even until now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley. Tomorrow turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation, which murmur against me? I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Say unto them, As truly as I live, said the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. What were they speaking? It was better for us to go into Egypt. You've led us out here to die. You've only led us out. You've just made yourself a captain over us just to lead us out here to die, you see. Verse 29, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But your little ones, which you said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness after the number of the days in which ye search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities even 40 years and ye shall know my breach of promise. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed and there they shall die. Everybody see that? That's a, that's a could you imagine? <laughs> now, you know, you were hearing my voice. Imagine God's thundering voice shaking the earth when he's talking. The children of Israel, they sent 12 spies in to spy the land for 40 days. And now they're being told, a day for a year, a day for a year, for every day that y'all went in there beholding what was supposed to be y'all's, 
that, that day represents a year for what y'all are going to spend out in the wilderness, 40 years. Now, I want you to think about this. Moses is standing there listening at the Lord talk to these people. And he already knows I'm around 81 years old, 80 years old. He understands he can't go in either. That 40 years was for him as well. He knows now I got to play babysitter to you people. This was just supposed to be for my commission from Egypt to the promised land was just supposed to be for a little under a month. And now I'm stuck with y'all for 40 years. Now, I want you to think about what that must have done to him. And now let's think about this. And in those 40 years, if you, we're not, we won't cover all of this tonight. But in those 40 years, look at what all was what was going on. Now they know that they stuck for 40 years. So now it's 40 years of more murmuring and complaining. Would to God we were back in Egypt where the flesh pots were. We miss eating. We're tired of this manna. It's, it's sickening to us. And here was the issue. God only intended them to, for them to eat the manna for a couple of weeks. They were supposed to go in and possess the land. If they went in and possessed the land like they were supposed to, they could have been eaten the way they, they needed to. But God wasn't going to change their diet for them. You knew that this manna was for the wilderness. And since you chose to stay out in the wilderness, then you also chose to eat this manna for the next 40 years. And there were times they complained and fussed and the Lord would give them meat and then as they were chewing the meat, he would start striking them and killing them dead. You can just read, uh, most of you know the story, it was just 40 years of murmur and it was their fault. 40 years of murmuring, complaining, whining, doing all of that and it was their fault. Moses had the faith to go in, but he was stuck with those people 40 years. Now, what happened? It, it, we read about in the, in the 20th chapter. So everybody understand all the murmuring and complaining? You, you know, there's a whole lot of things that went on in between then and, 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 and that. You know, some of the people, they got tired of looking at Moses and Aaron. Some of them wanted Aaron's office. And so one day they decided, Cor and his company decided they were going to take over Aaron's office. And God came down and said, okay, tell the folks that's with Cor to stand over there. Everybody that's with you, stand over here. He said, I'm about to do something that the earth has never seen done before. And uh, they, they all split up on whose side they were on. And the Bible says God came down and he split the earth so that Cor and his company, they went down into hell alive. And then he closed the earth back up on them. The people, when they saw that, they took off running. Right after that, what did they do? Did they repent? No. They complained. You still, you see, this is what we're talking about. You brought us out here to kill us. <laughs> never, <laughs> never their fault. It was, it was never them. It was, as always, Moses. Now, what was the problem with that? See, over time, and this, and this is what I want to share with you, brothers, uh, you, we really have to examine ourselves in our everyday lives. You could be cool on day one, day two, week one, week two. I'm not letting this stuff get, it ain't getting to me. It ain't getting to me. But see, the devil's got all the time in the world. He'll keep nagging at you, nagging at you. Nagging at you, nagging at you. Everybody understand it now? Let's think about this. Come here, Brother Jones. So let's think about this. This right here, does this hurt? Now, think about if I do this for 40 years. You think he's going to get tired of it? <laughs> so you see, and I'm trying to share with you, that's how the devil operates. You can go ahead now. That's how the devil operates. He, he got all your life. As long as the Lord Jesus Christ is tarrying, he, you know, he wants you to overlook it. This ain't, this ain't bother, devil, you ain't bothering me. I ain't letting you get up. This ain't, I got all day, devil. You see, you, you could come with that attitude and the devil said, okay, well, one day, one day you're going to wake up and you're going to forget to pray. One day you're going to be too sleepy at night to pray. And when you wake up in the morning, your temper is going to catch you off guard. 
That's what happened to Moses. One day he woke up like what we say on the wrong side of the bed. And listen, that's what the devil wanted from the jump. He know he knew if I can get Moses. Does everybody see? Moses, one of the greatest prophets in the Bible and could not finish what God had set him to do in this world. Did not finish it. Why? Because of his temper. He allowed people to get under his skin. Think about it. Now, I want you to think about that. So you all keep in mind now all of the history that we've laid out before. This is the, one of the only things that we see Moses do wrong. These people been disobeying, been cutting up, acting a plum fool. And Moses lose it one time. And what does God tell him? Yeah, that's it, Moses. That's it for you. You didn't sanctify me before the people. Could you imagine now? 40 years dealing with these knucklehead people. 40 years. You'd have thought Moses had gotten some grace. But you know, to whom much is given, much is required. Moses was supposed to be better than those people. Moses was held to a higher standard. All those people knew was Egypt. Moses had a calling on his life, you see. And, and so, you see, we, we have to think about those things. Well, we can look across the street and see how much mercy and grace somebody else is getting. It don't mean we'll get it. We have to do what we know to do. Listen, God made it very plain what he wanted Moses to do. If Moses didn't understand, he could have raised his hand and asked God, God, I, I don't quite understand. Are you telling me to speak or, or, or strike? What, what is it? You see, what none of that. Moses understood exactly what God had told him to do, and he went and purposely disobeyed it, purposely disobeyed it. Now, now here was the issue. In front of the rebels, in front of the people, all this time, and I'm going to just share with you why God dealt with Moses with a heavy hand. All this time, Moses was righteous before those people. He was a God-like man to those people. He represented God to those people. That's all they knew of God was what Moses told them. And so now when he strikes the rock twice, and then call the people rebels. Must we fetch you water to drink, ye rebels? What did God say? Because you did not sanctify me in front of the people. In other words, Moses, you've made yourself a rebel now. Now I have to deal with you with a heavy hand because you chose to disobey me in front of these people. So I can't let you bring them in because they will always have a cloak for their disobedience as long as I allow you to be the head of this congregation, you see. And so this is why we see God deal with Moses with that heavy hand. Now, the question we're gonna, that we're asking tonight, what was it that caused Moses to lose like that? What was it? Let's go real briefly. Let's go to the 13th chapter. In fact, hold on just a second. Let's, let's go back to the 20th chapter of the book of Numbers. Let's read something real briefly, and then we'll go to the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. The 20th chapter of the book of Numbers, and we're going to start reading. We'll pick up, we'll read at verse 23. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in Mount Hor by the coast of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, for he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel, because ye rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. Take Aaron and Eleazar, his son, and bring them up unto, the mount, unto Mount Or, and strip Aaron of his garments, and put them upon Eleazar, his son. And Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, and shall die there. And Moses did as the Lord commanded, and they went up into Mount Or in the sight of all the congregation. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them upon Eleazar, his son, and Aaron died there in the top of the mount. And Moses and Eleazar came down from the mount. And when all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, they mourned for, thir for Aaron for 30 days, even all the house of Israel. Everybody see that? 
that to me, that's one of the saddest. This chapter 20 is one of the saddest chapters in the Bible. Could you imagine now? Imagine what that must have been like for Moses and his brother and his nephew to be walking up this mountain. And Aaron knowing when I go up this mountain, I'm not coming down. He, he knowing I'm coming up, going up in my priestly robe and all my garments of holiness. And I'm going up to this mountain to be stripped of these things. Could you imagine that? I'm going up this mountain to be stripped of the garments that God had put on me. I'm going and I'm going to have all these things taken away from me in my sight. They're not going to wait until I'm dead. They, they're going to take these things off of me while I'm alive. That was, that was a horrible ceremony to see. If you can just picture that in your mind. And Moses having to do it. His older brother, Moses having to do that. And, and then him knowing that he's next. Him knowing my day is coming. Somebody's going to do this to me. Sad day for Israel. A sad chapter in the Bible. Let's go real briefly to the 13th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians now. We're going to see what happened to Moses. I think the same thing that happened to a lot of us if we're not careful. The 13th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to start reading at verse 1. Look what it says there, brothers. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, did Moses have the gift of prophecy? Yes, he did. And understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, what am I? I am nothing. Verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Everybody see that? Charity, what does charity do? What does it do now? Now, let's think about this. This is something that I've shared with my congregation recently. At one point, God was willing to destroy all of Israel and to start over with Moses. Who prayed for those people that God wouldn't do that? Moses. Only for him to turn around and lose his place. Could you imagine your position being taken because of a, you got mad at folks that you prayed for? <laughs> That's what happened to Moses. Could you imagine that now? Could you imagine? You know why? He didn't think it had he didn't think it was in him. He didn't know that one day he was gonna lose it. He was probably banking on the same grace that these people been getting. The same grace that for 40 years they've been getting grace, you know, and, and, and God is going to at least give me a shot at it. And I, I can make one mistake. God said, no, Moses, you understood the order. You understood. You understood. You knew better. Everybody see that now. What does the word charity mean? Love. Love. Love suffers long. Now, let's think about that. Moses had suffered for 40 years with those people, but he should have suffered longer. Here's, here's my rule of thumb. As long as God is giving people grace, I better have some grace for them. If God is not destroying people, I better not destroy people in my heart. My grace and my love for people better be longer than God's grace. Other than that, how am I going to stand in the gap for him? How can I be of, of help to the kingdom of God if I don't like people? If I don't got aggravated? If I'm upset? What is, what is my point of living? That's basically what, this is, what we're reading here in, the chapter, in chapter 13 here in 1 Corinthians. You can, you can give your body to be burned for somebody else. You, you can put yourself in a line of sight. Somebody... 
shooting a, shooting a gun, you can get in the way and take the bullet. But if you didn't do it for love, it don't profit you anything. What is the Lord telling us in this chapter? It don't matter what our calling is, how great the calling is. If you're doing it for anything outside of love, it's not going to profit you anything. That's what happened to Moses. And, and so we'll explain what happened to Moses over time. Listen, Moses loved his people to the point where he was willing to kill an Egyptian and become a fugitive for those people. He loved them enough. He had already was set in life. And at 80 years old, he loved them enough to obey God's call and go back into Egypt where he was a fugitive at to get those people out of there. That's how much he loved those people. But the devil had 40 more years of this. 40 more years, Moses. I see your love now, but where is it going to be in 40 years? We see the problem was Moses wasn't checking himself. He wasn't really examining himself. He was trying to pretend everything, everything's okay. Say, I'm praying for my enemies. Everything is okay. I'm praying for these people. I'm, I'm the reason why God's not destroying them. So see, God, everything is okay with me. But it wasn't. Forty years, the devil wore him out with the rebellion of other people. Forty years. And over time, he lost it. What was it? 40 years, he lost his love that he started off with for those people. That's what happened. That's what happened. 40 years, that love began to dwindle. It began to dwindle. You know, a lot of times that happens in marriage as well. It happens in relationships. You know, everybody is cuddling and really happy. The first week of marriage, second week of marriage, you might even make it to the first year of marriage, still a newlywed and feeling like you just got married yesterday. What about year number two? What about year three? You see, what, what, you know what happens? Life happens. You begin, to see, you begin to see that the other person is human. They disappoint you at different times. And if you don't, like what the Word tells us to do, renew, give them brand new mercy, then your love begin to dwindle. We have to give people brand new mercy. We have to make sure we are examining ourselves to make sure that our love for people is where it's supposed to be. See, love, it'll make you act a certain way around people. It'll stop you from getting aggravated. Love puts you in another person's shoes so that you can really see, okay, I understand that you're a little bit difficult to deal with, but, but I love you enough to actually talk to you and get to know you, and then I'll understand why that may be the case. Love takes time to get to know people. Love just don't think, well, folks, just nobody's just born cutting up and acting a fool. But love takes time to get to know people. What's their history? What have they gone through? What, would have, what decisions would have I have made had I been in the same predicament? You see, that's what love does. But what happens is when we start sitting in the seat of the scornful, we start thinking that we're better than other people because of maybe what we see about them, we begin to lose our love for people. And when we begin to lose our love for people, we become bitter. You can't be bitter and have love in your heart at the same time. They, they can't, bitterness and love can't live in the same place. That's the reason why the Bible tells us, I think it's in the book of Colossians, husbands, be not bitter against your wives. Why does it tell us husbands not to be bitter against our wives? Because over time, you're going to see some things about them just like they're going to see some things about you. You see? And so he's warning us, don't get bitter. Dwell with them according to knowledge. Understand that they're the weaker vessel. You see, they, they emotional and things like that. Don't hold that against them. I created them to be that way, to balance you. Y'all balance each other. But over time, if we're not careful, we'll get bitter. We'll be upset. 
We'll be angry. And here's the thing. Sometimes people think uh, if, if I could just get me another girlfriend, I can divorce this one and I'll just get me another. And you know what? You'll be the same way with the other one as you were in the previous one. Why? Because you're in a relationship. You see, people don't, you know, if you pick up bitterness against one person, you're going to carry it with you in the next relationship. You're not going to change. It's going to still be there. You see that? Listen, here's, and here's what I say. Uh, the same love that it takes to love my wife, I can just love her. I ain't got to try to find something brand new. I can stay right there and work it out. Why? Because if I get bitter, I'm bitter all over the place. It ain't just with her. I'm just a bitter person all over the place, everywhere I go. And so, see, that was Moses' problem. He was not checking himself concerning that. I'm going to share with you uh, let's go ahead and keep reading. Let's read verse 5 again. Uh, verse 4. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemly. Everybody see that? Did Moses behave unseemly? Yes, he did. So then we know that love wasn't there at that time. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Everybody see that? So does everybody understand that? If I got love on the inside of me, I'm not, I'm not easily provoked. It take a long time for somebody to get under my skin. I'm not just ready to snap at people if I have love. You see that? If love is truly there. Look what it says. Verse 5, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things. In other words, love is not skeptical. Hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in, per, in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, let me, you may wonder, what, what does, why is Paul saying that and he's talking about love? Because when a grown, if a grown man don't have love, it makes him wishy-washy. It makes him be all over the place. One day he's in a good mood, one day, the next day he's in a bad mood. One day he can tolerate folks, the next day he can't. Everything that we just read here early on in this chapter, this is what he's talking about. One day he's mature, and the next day he's just down in the dumps. Just, it's just always wishy-washy. So Paul is saying, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Verse 12, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Verse 13, and now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Moses had all the faith in the world. I want you to think about that now. He had enough faith to go down into the most powerful country in the world at that time and conquer them with a stick. He had enough faith to raise that stick and to part the Red Sea. All the faith in the world had enough faith to call fowls from the air to feed the children of Israel with, to speak to the rock for it to bring forth water. He had all of the faith in the world that it took to bring the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land. But here was the problem. His love ran out before his faith did. His love ran out. And listen, and this is what I'm saying. Again, what, how do we start this message? My prayer is that the Lord will let me finish my race, will let me do everything that he's put me in this earth to do. Whatever that is, my prayers is that the Lord will let me do that. So if that's the case, then my prayer is also this. Lord, give me the love that it takes to finish my race. I don't want to be like Moses 
and stop midway and not be able to finish. Could you imagine 40 years you've dealt with this people and the only thing you get out of it is to peek over to just to look into what you're supposed to be experiencing yourself? Could you imagine your parents telling you, if you're good for the next month, you're going to Disneyland if you're a child. And then you do something wrong, they say, no, you're not going to Disneyland. Here, here's a picture of it. (laughs) And that was Moses' lot in life. You be good for the next 40 years, Moses. You'll get to go to Disneyland. Oh, no. Yep, you messed up. Here's a picture of it. Here's a picture of it. Could you imagine now? What was the problem? His love ran out. His love ran out. You know, over uh, the years, I used, to, I used to watch boxing. I was a real big boxing fan. I used to love watching boxing. I, was, I would get some of the pay-per-views if I thought it was worth watching. And it was amazing, an amazing thing to me to see boxers, you know, when they first start off, uh, they're knocking everybody out. They got a good record, 20 and 0, 30 and 0, you know, all those types of things. And you think, you know, with that kind of boxing record at some point, you know, nobody's going to beat them. They're going to retire the heavyweight champion of the world. They're going to retire the cruiserweight champion of the world, whatever weight class they're in. They're, they're too good. Nobody has anything for them. And then one day you see them, they come out to the ring, they just not looking like themselves. You know, one, one case in point was Mike Tyson and Buster Douglas. Nowhere in the world Buster Douglas was supposed to be Mike Tyson. No way. No way. No way. But he did. And over time in, in, in studying that and just paying attention to the boxers' lives that, you know, it seemed like they were on, on up and up, and then one day they come out and they lose to somebody they're not supposed to lose to. It was always the same thing. They did not train the way they were supposed to train. What was part of the problem? Really what it was, in a nutshell, they lost the love that they had for the sport they were in. They no longer thought of it the way that they did when they first got into it. And we can just bring it to us in everyday life. You can start a job. You can love that job. But then life happens. You find out people are people no matter where you're working at. And what happens is all of a sudden you stop liking the job. You no longer love it. When you first started the job, they wanted you to be there at 6 o'clock. You were showing up at 530. Now you show up at what, 630. See, our behavior changes when our love runs out. When our love runs out, our behavior changes, you see. John 3.16, what does that tell us? We're not going to turn that. Most of you all are to know it. So what's, what's, what's the first key word there? For God, so what? What did he do because he loved the world? Gave his own. Does everybody see that? Now, do you know that God didn't have to put that in the Bible? It could have just said, you know what? God God gave his only begotten son. We wouldn't have thought anything different about it. God, We know that God gave his only begotten son, don't we? So why does it say before that, for God so loved the world? What it is saying is this love was God's motivation for sending his son. Love was God's motivation for sending his son. Listen, get, we all want faith. We all need hope. But I'm telling you, without love, neither one of them are going anywhere. Hope is not going anywhere. Faith is not going anywhere. Your love has to be longer than your faith. Your love has to be longer than your hope. Why? Because love is the motivator. That's the gas that keeps you going. Over the years, you know, in counseling with people and just observing in life, sometimes folks have been in bad relationships. I mean bad relationships. And might stay in it for years. 
I've seen women get mistreated, get beat on, and different things like that. I've seen it all. I've seen even men get mistreated and beat on by their, by their woman. I've seen that as well. You know, I know that's not common for folks to talk about, but it happens. <laughs> and everybody on the outside is looking in saying, you're a fool. Why are you putting up with that? Get out of there. I wouldn't put up with that. Some of us have said it. Some of us have had that said to us. I wouldn't deal with that. You know why? Because they're on the outside looking in. Why then are people on the inside dealing with it? Love. When you love somebody, you're going to put up with some stuff. When you love folks, you're going to put up with some stuff. Stuff that other folks on the outside, they don't understand. You see, they don't understand it. So that is what love does. It suffers long. It suffers long. Everybody else ain't got to understand it. They don't love them the way that you do. And so what am I saying? Love is our motivator. Love is what's supposed to motivate us. If you take love out of something, then the motive is wrong. If you take love out of it, the motive is wrong. And it won't last long. Does everybody understand that now? My wife, uh, bless her heart, she does my laundry once a week. And, uh, you know, she takes care of our home. And, uh, you know, she does things that maybe other women might have a problem with, whatever the case is. You know, uh, other people, I should say. Uh, and then you may ask, well, why does she do that? Because she loved me. Now, what would happen if her love ran out? What would happen if she didn't love me? Yeah, I'd be doing my own laundry. Does everybody see that now? How many of you have ever been in something like that? At the beginning, it's love. At the end, it's a problem. <laughs> does everybody understand it now? You know what love does? It makes everything not be a chore. My wife ain't thinking anything about it. She's not thinking anything about it. But see, if love is not there, it's a chore. If a woman don't love you, she don't want to give you a cup of water. Who are you? But if she love you, she growing your water. <laughs> and I ain't thinking a thing about it. Don't care what nobody got to say about it. I love this man. The same thing is true on the other side. I love my wife. I give her whatever she wants because I love her. If my love ever ran out, it would be a chore. And, you know, when, when love run out, everything, you, all of a sudden, you see stuff you ain't never seen before. I didn't know you had a gap in your teeth. <laughs> everything about you start taking notes of everything that they're doing did you know you snore at night that's not attractive at all sleep on your side how many of you understand what I'm saying now yeah when love run out you get to nitpicking the same way Moses must we fetch you water to drink ye rebels he had never called them that before. But when love ran out, he started calling names. He started nitpicking. And see, if we don't have love, that's the way we'll be. We'll, we'll case the room and figure everybody out. We got them all pegged of how they really are in life. Love don't do that. You see? Love don't do that. I hope we understand that, brothers. Let's ask the Lord to, that we'll grow in our love so we can deal with one another. Listen, it ain't one person in this world that's exactly like somebody else. And I'm glad that God has it fixed that way. You know why? Because the Bible says iron sharpens iron. My best friend ain't supposed to be exactly like me. The person that's sitting next to me is not supposed to be exactly like me. They, they're supposed to rub me the wrong way. I'm supposed to rub them the wrong way. And we love each other in spite of it. How many of you ever sharpened a knife? How do you do it? Like this, don't you? See? Iron sharpens iron. Wood don't sharpen iron. 
pillows don't sharpen iron. Iron. Both of us. Hard-headed. Both of us. But we ain't, we ain't departing ways. We're not parting ways because we're that way. We're going to learn how to love each other. We're going to learn how to deal with each other. Why? Because that's how God causes his people to grow. How are you going to grow if you're only around people that's exactly like you? See, we have to learn how to deal with each other and all of our shortcomings and all the things we might not like about each other. We have to learn how to deal with each other. Other than that, we won't grow. You show me the person that's isolated and to themselves, can't stand to be around people, and I show you a person like what Paul says. I'm, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I behaved as a child. Children separate themselves like that. In other words, a child like mine don't want to be bothered with anybody. Why? Because everybody get under my skin. But if you're mature, you understand that's all a part of God's process. God is using these differences to help me to grow. Thank you, Lord, for putting me around these individuals. Thank you, Lord, for not letting me get in my way in everything, not thinking that I'm the only one in this world. You see, God uses our differences. And so in that, we have to also pray and ask God, Lord, help me not to run out of love. Help me not to get aggravated with people. Help me to love people, even if they're different than me. Help me to love them. You know why? Because somebody loves you in spite of yourself as well. Everybody see. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, I thank you for all of my brothers that are sitting here tonight. And I pray right now, Lord, that you will help all of our love to grow. Help our love, Lord, to look like yours. Help us to be long-suffering. Lord, we thank you so much for the word that you spoke to us tonight. Lord, I pray over everyone tonight, Lord, anyone here that may be not feeling well in their bodies, Lord, I ask that you will heal them right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we've heard what you had to say tonight. Help us to take this back to our places and live it. We know, Lord, that your word is meant to be lived. So, Lord, we ask that you will give us the same love that you have for your people so that we can be better people ourselves. We know what your word says, Lord. By this shall men know that we are your disciples if we have love one for another. So, Lord, help us to have that love for one for another. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, brother. Yes, sir.